Can you hear me now? He said hopefully. Did not have any problems last night, and here you've seen when I've got it on push to talk, it's not paying any attention whatsoever to my settings. Nice. That's fantastic, for the record. Just absolutely wonderful. Had no problems last night. Push to talk goes on, and yet it's not actually push to talk. You're still getting audio. Ha <laughs> ha that's fantastic. Well, I guess we'll just have to do an open mic then, because apparently Open Broadcaster Studio is... <laughs> yeah, there might be a little bit of sarcasm here. I had no problems with this last night in my test fort, for the record. You can go back and look at the broadcast. I have it set up for Push to Talk. That's what I used all night. Worked wonderfully. Started up today, and all of a sudden, Push to Talk doesn't want to cooperate. Awesome. Fantastic. So, my incredibly broken up broadcast here, guys. Uh, bear with me. The first ten minutes have been an absolute shambles. Let's try and get it going. So,
So let's see if it's working now. I guess we'll just have to do an open mic. Can you hear me? The other thing, of course, is I'm troubleshooting this with a 60 second delay due to the streaming. All right. So, tags. <laughs> and I'm not sure how much of this you guys have heard already since I've done this about three times now with audio in different states. We're disabling the aquifer tags so that none of our materials will actually have aquifers once we start playing. Okay. Now, you could go through and tweak all sorts of different things in here. This controls all kinds of things. If, for example, you wanted to make a different material into an iron ore, this is the place to do it. Um, you could, for example, find limonite in here. Oh, we're in stone layer. Excuse me. That's uh, layer stone here. Let me back up one. In stone mineral, you can find limonite. And this controls, for example, which ores are metals of which, or which stones are ores of which metal. So, for example, here's hematite, and you can see when I for when I smelt this down, I'm going to get iron out of it at 100% chance. You could change this so theoretically, if you mined a, a, a thing of hematite, you could get uh, gold out of it, for example, or iron and gold, or iron and gold and platinum if you really wanted to. Um, there's no real sensible limitation if you want to think of it that way. The, the raw is literally defining the world. So in your world you could change it how, however you want. We're going to make relatively minimal modifications to the generic setup. Um, I turn off aquifers because frankly I don't find that they add too much to a new player's experience of the game and when you're ready to start dealing with aquifers as a more advanced player uh, they'll be there when you want to turn them back on. Turn them on, generate a world, and away you go. Keep in mind that any changes to the raw files that's the raws, have to be done prior to a world being created. Uh, changing raws midstream can cause all sorts of unpleasant, unpredictable, and undesirable side effects that you don't want to even think about, contemplate, or mess with. Uh, when you tinker with the rules of the universe, it turns out that the universe can actually break. And it can break in funny ways, and it can break in terrible ways, and most of those ways generally aren't good for your ongoing games. So. Uh, if you're going to be tinkering with your raws, my strong suggestion is tinker with them before you create the world, not after, and don't go back. However, you can actually modify the, rule, the, the rules of the universe midstream if you really want to. Um, out here in your save files, you'll find the raw folder duplicated for that world. Uh, you can change the raws. I make no promises that... Doing so with a world that was generated with one set of raws will have any functional, beneficial, or useful output on the far side if you change your save games midstream, but you can. Uh, if you're going to try and update a game to some change you've made in the raws, you must update it in the save folder. Updating it in the basic game uh, folder only pertains to those games or to those worlds you're generating from scratch, so it won't help you change one midstream. Um, to be honest, I've never actually done it with a, with one midstream. I do it before I start, or I don't do it at all, and generally I don't mess with it. Um, it's one of those things where it's neat to know about, and if you're feeling your oats and you want to go out and make your wagon wood sublimate directly to gas, you can do that. All sorts of tinkering tricks you can do if you want to play a modded game. Uh, in addition to the vanilla game, you'll find references in the Bay 12 forums to a modification set called Masterwork. That's actually a collection of modifications that have been submitted by uh, at least a user, and probably several by now. Uh, it contains new races, new reactions, new ingredients and such. It's basically an expansion of the default game. When you start to feel like Dwarf Fortress is boring or tedious, uh, that's when I'd start looking at mods. And to be honest, as a new player, other than disabling aquifers, I don't know that I'd mess with mods much at all. Um, you'll have enough to learn just to get started, and then at that point you'll do, you'll be ready to add things in when you're ready. So most of these things I don't touch. I turn entombing pets off because it's an annoyance. It's not really game breaking, but it's kind of a pain in the rear end to create a coffin and then find out that somebody buried Fluffy instead of the you know the well loved pillar of your community who is now sitting in the middle of your stockpile and rotting slowly while you're waiting on somebody to stop socializing and get with the coffin making. So I turn these off if I really want to entomb a noble or, or loyal pet who, you know, single-handedly stopped a goblin siege. I can always do that directly and manually. I can 
I can immortalize them, you know, with a slab or something. I can, you know, enable a coffin, forbid everybody else, and make sure that that corpse gets buried in that coffin if I really want to. There are ways around it, but leaving it as off by default is, it just avoids some annoyance for me personally. Now, let's talk machine for a moment. Um, I'm running an i7, and Dwarf Fortress is still, sadly, only a multi-core process, so despite having a reasonably beefy rig, uh, I can't really get much more on the, on the point for Dwarf Fortress. So don't go crazy upgrading your population cap, visitor cap, and soldier and monster caps here. Uh, if you put too many things on the map at once, you can suffer frame rate death. You can find that very quickly if you were to, you know, increase the soldier cap, increase your population cap, increase your visitor cap, and then start producing wealth fast. You will hit frame rate death very, very quickly as babies, visitors, immig or migrants moving in, and suddenly you get a monster, you know, 300 person invasion, and your fort stalls because it simply can't process frames at any reasonable pace. Um, generally speaking. 200 is going to be really slow, uh, especially once you start getting into, that's 200 from your stuff, and then 120 from invasion, or 160 from the invasion guys. So be careful about increasing your population caps at all. Um, I, I wouldn't go much beyond uh, the, the, the default settings, to be perfectly frank. Uh, child cap, I've tinkered with this in prior set, prior games. You can touch it or not touch it. It works properly, so I'm not probably going to mess with it this time. The numbers here are lowest percentage or maximum children, and it will use the lowest value. So if you have 200 uh, dwarves in your fort, 10% of your fort, for example, could be uh, the absolute cap. So this is 10 babies and children maximum, or 20% of your fort. Well, in a fort of 200, that's going to be uh, what, 40, 40 kids? And so 10 is the smaller number, and it will use the 10 instead. So that puts a hard cap on your kids. Early on, uh, the lower number will probably be the percentage. If, for example, you had a nice evenly distributed male and female ratio in your starting seven, and you were to have kids, up to 20% of those seven could be kids, and that's smaller than the 10 absolute cap. And so you would, yeah, that would be the number that ruled. And it will use the lowest one, so it allows you to keep better control of the number of children in your fort. That's important. Dwarven women do not drop their babies before they go rushing off to frontline infantry duty. So you'll need to be careful about how many mothers you have and how many you allow. Now that's over and above the fact that uh, kids are their own processing tasks and therefore uh, have to deal with... Uh, frame rate drag basically caused by their AI if they're moving around or seeking food, for example, just like you will with pets and other things. Uh, 10 and 20 are the defaults, and I'm probably just going to leave them right there. Now, I am going to open up the init editor. I am going to scroll down through here because there are some things that I typically tweak. Uh, many of these things can be seen either here or in the advanced tab, which is another collection of init folder, uh, init file objects or or things. Just like the raw files, the init files are controlled by tags. Anything that's not in brackets is a comment. Malformed tags can cause bad things. Don't do them incorrectly. So be careful when you tweak your init files manually and be careful that you do it correctly. Um, it's uh, Most of these things I wouldn't mess with manually per se. If it can be done with a button, it's easier to just flip the button. But... If you go down through here, you'll find some things that can't be tweaked directly or that uh, are slightly more esoteric than the average button controls are. And you may want to mess with some of these if you're finding functionality features later on. Uh, they'll be here when you're ready. However, one thing I do like to turn on invariably is logging of map rejects. And I do like to set my embark rectangle slightly larger than the default 3x3. Personally, I like a little more space to play with, and a 4x4 works pretty good. I tweak my path costs a little bit to uh, spread them out a little better. And I say that from my personal perspective. So if you look, these are powers of three. Three times one, three times three, three times nine, and they just scale up. Um, basically, this is for determining how tightly a path can be followed. Later on, we'll have the ability to modify uh, the traffic patterns that our dwarves will walk as they progress from place to place. And ordinarily, that's going to be something that we'll let the AI do, but occasionally we may want to tweak that. If, for example, I have restricted territory like above a frozen pond that I don't want my dwarves to be good playing on, I can set that terrain to restricted and my dwarves will tend to path around it unless a job specifically takes them to that area. 
so. In this case, the 27 here represents the pathing cost for those restricted tiles. If a dwarf has a job on the other side of the pond, they will go around unless it would take them more than 27 tiles to do so. And that's per tile of restricted pond. So if I had three restricted pond tiles, that's three times 27 normal tiles that they would have to walk around, basically. Um, typically, we're going to leave that at normal and we won't mess with it. Be cautious if you set these numbers too large. You can lag your pathfinding and that will hurt your gain performance. Don't get crazy. Um, I like a scaling of three, but that's me personally. I don't have any... Uh, I don't have any uh, software engineering reason as to why that should be. It's just my personal uh, reason. Uh, you can see here, coffin, no pets default. That's the burial option for pets being off by default. Most of these things are colors or uh, things you won't need to touch. Where do you want your idler count to display? We'll show that up top. Uh, population, child cap, visitor cap, all this stuff is in the buttons now, so you don't have to mess with all of this stuff manually if you want to. Uh, know what you're changing before you change it in the init files. Just like the RAWs, they can significantly alter how your game will perform. Um, I'm going to save my inits because I've made some manual changes. Some things that I generally like to turn on by default are auto saves being seasonal, pause on save being yes, and backup saves being yes. This I've occasionally, not very commonly, Dwarf Fortress is very stable, but I occasionally do have crashes. Seasonal auto saves allow me to go back to the start of the season, which is at least not that far back. The Having yearly auto saves means I could, at the end of a year, for example, lose nearly four seasons of progress. That's a long way to go back if I'm not ready for it. Backing up saves means that it will not only save seasonally, but each season save will get its own slot, so to speak. So if I need to go back to a particular season to investigate how something happened in my fort or to uh, revert because I want to do something differently and made a huge mistake or whatever and I want to go back, you can do that. Uh, it also protects you in the event that your save files become corrupted. Now, I have to confess, I've never actually had that happen, but I've heard stories. So, backup saves means that if it ever did happen to me, I would at least have a save that I can revert to. Uh, I do save my game initially when I first land at the Embark site. Basically, if I find a particularly nice site, that gives me a nice, clean save where I haven't done anything yet. Uh, I have my Embark, I, my dwarves are there, my gear is there, but I haven't actually started to develop it at all. And at that point, I'm given the option to decide whether I want to progress the same way I did before or do it differently. And I can play that same embark over and over and over as many times as I like. Um, at the end of the stream tomorrow, I'll be bundling all of these things up. My, Not my init files. You'll have to modify those yourselves since I didn't make too many changes directly. But my, uh, my World Gen Seed, my save games, including all the backup saves... I'll pack all that stuff up and throw it out on the Dwarf Fortress file depository so that those of you who might want to follow along uh, with the progress of the fort uh, more directly or to perhaps load the game up and dig into it yourself, you'll be able to do that by pulling those saves down and loading them up in your own game. Uh, I Saves are generally compressed. Dwarf Fortress saves are not small critters. I like to make sure that they keep that on. I haven't had any problems, so I generally don't touch it, but as you can see here, if you experience problems with your saves being corrupted or whatever, you can try turning that off. I can honestly say I haven't had a save game corruption ever. Um, processor priority. This is going to determine how often Dwarf Fortress gets touched by your operating system. The default is normal. You can set that up a ways and not hurt anything. Dwarf Fortress is a single core process. It's not going to tie up your entire processor by itself. Um, Process Legends exports allows us to compress and sort the files that come out of Legends. We'll touch on Legends briefly in a minute. Okay, graphics. Now, I messed around with graphics files briefly the other night, trying with some of the other ones. Uh, this year, again, we're going to go back to my classic Phoebus. I love it. It's nice and clearly distinct. I can easily tell what's going on, and it doesn't feel like it's overwhelming me with circus lights and colors. Um, it's clear. It's distinct. It's, however, sadly, only supported by the community at this point. The developer has long since moved on, and I dreadfully, dreadfully fear that Phoebus might go by the wayside at some point. Feel free to experiment to your heart's content with whatever graphics make you comfortable. Um, the reason I use graphics and not ASCII is because ASCII gives me a quite literal, personal, physical headache. Um, trying to stare at very complex collections of 
uh, scrambled ASCII characters just throws my brain for a loop. I don't know whether that's because I write software for a living, and so I'm expecting to see these things in an entirely different context, or if I've just never gotten over the hump of uh, the occasional bout of dyslexia and it just garbles the screen for me, I'm not sure. But the tile sets basically give me the ability to see the game in sprites, and whether that's because I'm a latter-day creature of video games or because I'm just physically unable to tolerate the ASCII, graphics sets are without a doubt the only reason why I've been able to play Dwarf Fortress today. Well, okay, to be fair, graphic sets and Dwarf Therapist, but we'll get to Therapist in a minute. Um, I've tried a few of these along the way, Mayday, Space Fox, Obsidian, I've tried those. Uh, Iron Hand, uh, my personal favorite, and the one we'll be using is Phoebus. If you have conf if you use a different tile set or if you're not familiar with tile sets and you have some confusion about what's going on at any given moment, stop me. K take a note of when it happened on the stream and what I was looking at and ask me what's going on and I'll try to explain. I find the Phoebus tile set to be fairly uh, straightforward in terms of what, what's going on. It's fairly easy to, to see and understand. And it it's fairly minimalist in terms of how bright or colorful it seems. Some of the other tile sets I've played with just seem very busy to the point that they, they feel like they're occluding the game more than they are displaying it in some cases. Uh, most of these settings are, you know, just your personal improvements. Um, I like to be able to see the depth of liquids because that's actually a, an important thing that actually impacts your gameplay. Uh, water of depth 4 to 7 actually has an impact on your dwarves that water of depth 3 and below does not. And so knowing how deep water is can actually impact how you're going to play. Uh, generally, I would leave print mode alone. I wouldn't touch it because text with text will be text is a fantastic modification that they've added since I started playing that basically allows us to see some simulated 3D effects. Uh, if we look down on the world from above, a pit will appear to look like a pit, actually. You'll be able to see stuff at the bottom, even though it's several Z levels below the actual displayed level. Text will be text will keep that around for us and allow us to uh, to see those. I'd use it. Um, unless you find problems with it, I wouldn't turn it off. In terms of utilities, there are a whole collection of these. I'm going to touch on the ones that we're going to use heavily, and then I'll briefly touch on some of the other ones that I have used in the past or that I've or that I think uh, new players might want to look at at some point. In particular, we'll be heavily using Dwarf Therapist and Sound Sense. Uh, Therapist allows you to modify your dwarf behavior, uh, your jobs and, and needs and so forth, uh, directly. You can basically uh, scan your dwarves and get the same kind of overview that you would from the game itself, but it's organized in a much more coherent and user-friendly fashion in a, in a spreadsheet-type display instead of the uh, menu-driven interface of the default game. Now, you can do things with Therapist if you enable all the cheat features that will let you do things like assign labors to kids and so forth. We won't be doing any of that. Uh, I don't need, want, or have any desire to tweak any of those things. But if you're feeling froggy and you want to mess with the game rather heavily, Therapist allows you to modify some things that you couldn't otherwise modify. Um, sound Sense is a sound engine for the game. Uh, basically, if you've played Dwarf Fortress at all, it's got some lovely sound, but it's kind of repetitive. Sound Sense will read the game's log file and play various sound effects and music depending on what's going on. So we'll get seasonal rain effects, we'll get uh, music that plays every time the season changes, we'll hear our dwarves sparring, we'll hear combats, we'll hear them object when they cancel things, and so forth. Those sound cues are wonderful once your fort starts to get to any size at all, frankly, because the announcements uh, line at the bottom is one line, and it's very easy for six or eight or ten announcements to come in at once and simply scroll that so fast you miss the important one that you were waiting on or that you cared most about. Um, SoundSense will basically allow me to kind of, while I'm discussing the stream with you guys, also enable me to... Uh, set up and control my fortress uh, sort of indirectly. If you've played any video games outside of Dwarf Fortress at all, you know how important sound can be to your understanding of what's going on in the game world, and there's no exception here. Sound Sense is uh, it's not an indispensable tool. You can play without it, but it enriches your experience hugely, and I strongly recommend it to all new players uh, from the get-go. When you start, when we start Dwarf Fortress up, these will start. I will go ahead and launch them ahead of time, just to pull them up so you've actually seen the interfaces. Uh, Dwarf Therapist will try to connect to a running game of Dwarf Fortress if you have one. If you don't, it will warn you, hey, I couldn't find Dwarf Fortress. That's okay, we don't have Dwarf Fortress running yet. If you start it up early like this, you have to make sure you connect it 
manually, and I'll go through that in a minute. And basically in this giant white pane here, it will display all my dwarves and their various labors and what they're doing and allow us to modify all those things. SoundSense is a pair of windows, a DOS prompt that controls its logging and what's going on behind the scenes, and then also a user interface that you really care about, which controls your volume knobs and what's actually being played. Uh, we'll use SoundSense for music. Please let me know, guys, if the music from SoundSense turns out to be a little loud. Sometimes it's balanced a little high and it's difficult for you guys to make out what I'm saying. If that comes to be the case or if you can't hear me, just shout and I'll tweak SoundSense to be a little lower. Um, if you find that it's too soft and you can't really hear what's going on in the game this, and all you're hearing is me talking, let me know and I'll turn it up so you guys can actually hear what's going on as well. Um, it's sometimes a little difficult for me to balance the audio levels for the stream. Now, in addition to the utilities, we will make some use, at least briefly, of DF Hack in terms of uh, the multi-level view of text will be text, but also in terms of some of the other tools as I try to explain how the world is put together and how Dwarf Fortress works in a more general sense. I'll show you the reveal tool, although we won't really need or need it for anything, just to show you how the world's layers are put together and how minerals and such are organized in the world uh, to give you a brief glimpse into how caves work and so forth. Um, to be honest, if you're starting a game from scratch, I, Reveal is one of those things I don't really think that a new player should use, but if you're trying to lay out the ultimate perfect fortress, Reveal can come in really handy to make sure that your temple isn't interrupted by a cave, since although you could rebuild the walls, you can't engrave constructed walls, and therefore uh, natural walls in a lot of cases are better, and so being able to determine where underground obstacles are and avoid them is sometimes useful if you're trying to build a showcase for it, for example. Um, we won't need them, but I'll demonstrate reveal as well. Uh, prospect is a tool we'll touch. That's one that will allow me to see what sort of minerals I'll be finding once I arrive. It's sort of a, uh, a survey of the site that theoretically we'll embark on. And for a new player, that's one, one tool I highly recommend. Because if you're looking to, for example, experiment with iron smelting, it's really useful if your site actually has iron. You can do it without that but it's slower and much more error and problem prone. So if you're looking for a particular feature of, of landscape or terrain, Prospect will allow you to determine minerals, and most of the other tools that have been built into the starter pack will allow us to pick up most of the other things we'll care about. Now, you can mess around with mouse controls and all these other things. Auto labor, if you find that managing your dwarves is completely overwhelming to you, and you just want to tinker with settings without having to worry about which dwarf is doing which job, for example, then uh, what you'll want to do especially is uh, turn on auto labor. Now, I don't suggest that for new players, actually. It's one of those things where I wouldn't do it unless you were just absolutely, completely overwhelmed and unable to, to, to follow along whatsoever with the, uh, the mechanisms of Dwarf Fortress. The problem I have with auto labor is it's just not particularly clever about its assignments. Uh, it, it does a reasonable job of assigning labor, but I personally feel that a player can do better, and since I'm a control freak, I don't like turning it over to the machine any more than I absolutely have to anyway. Um, some of the other utilities and DF hack uh, items here I need to mention. Stone Sense and Armok Vision are, and ISO World are visualizers that will allow you to depict the world of Dwarf Fortress in uh, 3D, for example, in the case of Armok Vision. If you want to see what your towers and constructions look like in 3D, it might be worth firing those up. Uh, the developers are talking about eventually potentially allowing the game to be controlled in those, those add-on tools with their own user interface or some port over of the existing user interface. But that feature is not currently available, and so what you'll end up with is an ability to look into your fort, but not necessarily to control it. Uh, I may touch on those later. I don't really mess too much with the visualizers, uh, read at all, really. Uh, primarily because I'm happy with 2D. I've, <laughs> I, I grew up in the, the Atari and Nintendo era, and so 2D graphics don't bother me much. Um... 3D is neat, but I don't, I'm don't. i not necessarily wedded to it for Dwarf Fortress. Uh, 
in addition to those good things to to know about and potentially to to really care about are the uh the legends viewer or legends browser which allow you to scroll through your legends and lore of your world if you want to know who the biggest baddest forgotten beast was you can export the legends information and use those tools to investigate those we'll touch those briefly uh, a little later on quick fort allows you to export directly into your game blueprints of worlds or um, or settings that you might have I see that uh, this is acting a little funny I'm gonna bounce the stream real fast because I'm not getting any video on my stream either even after reloading so I'm gonna bounce this real fast.